The last six months have seen medical science scrambling to keep up with a novel coronavirus that confounds our understanding of how normal diseases function. How are we supposed to find our way through this deluge of information when it seems to be changing every day? What's real, what's right, and what's not? Who do we even trust? Very good question. Well, let's start with number one. Who am I and why am I talking about this? My name is Jez Medinger and I have a master's degree in engineering from University College Oxford, uh, where I graduated with honours in the year 2000, 751 years after the college was founded. So I'm not a doctor, but I do very much believe in science and everything that we've learnt in that time and the 20 years since. I've approached all my work with these films with the same analytical and academic rigour that was expected of me at Oxford which, for reference, is uh, rather more than I managed at the time. It's also worth mentioning that I do have a doctor on side vetting all of my content before it goes up, and that will of course continue to be the case. Why am I making these films? Well, if you Google me, you'll find that I'm also a documentary and narrative filmmaker. I'm normally behind the camera, but back in April, when I find myself still struggling with brutal post-viral symptoms many weeks after an initial COVID infection, I figured there must also be lots of other people out there struggling too, and no one was talking about it. The only platform I had available was this one, so here we are. The channel was originally intended to be about running and cars, but this seemed rather more important. Whilst the pandemic rampages around the world, there's been this huge gap in knowledge that we've been scrambling to try and fill, from the first studies that came out of China in February and March to the wave of European and American studies that we're starting to see now. But there's still a huge amount we don't know. And that empty space is dangerous. It's a crack into which anyone can leverage a crowbar and say they have the answer. When people are scared, they crave certainty and control, but both of those are in very short supply right now. What that means is that big sensationalist messages sell much better than measured probabilities. And the space is ripe for anything that offers people either a smidgen of certainty or a smidgen of control. Remember those social media posts going around a few months ago telling you to gargle warm water? Yeah, offering you a little bit of control. And the numerous conspiracy theories, whether it's the fact it came from a Chinese lab or 5G is somehow responsible, offer certainty. As humans, we're programmed to see cause and effect. If we see an effect, we automatically look for a cause. There has to be a reason. And if science can't provide a reason compelling enough, quickly enough, that space will quickly get filled. Who do we trust? If you'd asked this question five or 10 years ago, the answer might well have been quite different. President of the United States? Sure, he's not going to tell you to inject unproven drugs he can't pronounce, which subsequently have their FDA approval revoked. I just hope that hydroxychloroquine wins. And he's certainly not about to tell you to drink bleach. I'm not a doctor, but I'm like a person that has a good, you know what. And the World Health Organization, some of the best doctors and medical researchers in the world, you wouldn't expect their advice to change on an almost weekly basis, offering strange and often contradictory recommendations. And The Lancet, one of the world's oldest and most respected medical journals? You wouldn't expect them to have to retract a study two weeks after publishing it due to inconsistencies in the data. Notably though, this doesn't mean that hydroxychloroquine does work, just that this particular study showing it doesn't has some inconsistencies. What it does mean is that the messaging gets pretty confusing. And that blows the door wide open for bad science to walk right in. What is bad science? Well, it takes many forms, from Gwyneth Paltrow's jade and quartz vagina eggs to pharmaceuticals companies disadvantaging competitors in efficacy trials of their new products. One of the most critical stages for clinical trials is peer review, but COVID has made this really hard because the urgency of the pandemic has meant that some of the normal standards of clinical research have been bypassed or rushed. So the kind of retraction we recently saw of The Lancet becomes more likely. But it was still possible before. Look at Andrew Wakefield and the infamous MMR and autism paper that The Lancet took 12 years to retract. Thoroughly debunked, Wakefield had his medical license revoked from the GMC, but yet it still led to a whole movement of anti-vaxxers whose voices get louder by the day. We've since had outbreaks of both mumps and measles around the world, and 
Contrary to popular opinion, these aren't the mild conditions that people might think, and both can have serious, long-lasting implications. So, bad science is dangerous. And how about for COVID-19? Well, I'm not going to talk about the dangers of drinking bleach, inhaling boiling steam from a kettle, or the unreported heart failures in American COVID patients treated with hydroxychloroquine. But bad science can affect the behaviour of vast numbers of people. Look at the decision being weighed up by the UK government right now to drop the social distancing distance to one metre. Should we be lucky enough to get a vaccine for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, tens of millions of Americans are likely to refuse it. Tens of thousands could die. Closer to home, for those like me suffering from post-viral fatigue, the idea that graded exercise therapy would help you out of it was debunked quite thoroughly after the PACE trials of 2011. But the idea that it's a good thing and could help you recover somehow still persists. And yet GET may have taken hundreds or thousands of people from a recoverable post-viral condition into a chronic form of ME. How can we battle it? Well, on an individual level, bad science is often propagated when it helps people reinforce an existing opinion or worldview. It's also known as the circular belief system, where any evidence that disputes uh, that person's opinion or belief is instantly discarded, whilst any evidence that supports that belief is of course amplified. Think about it, and you probably know people who do this. To quote Ben Goldacre, you cannot reason people out of a position that they did not reason themselves into. At some level, we're all prone to this. It's called bias. So we need to be honest with ourselves when looking at information. Am I discarding this because I don't like it? Because it makes me feel uncomfortable? Or it contradicts what I believe to be the case? Look deeper into the information itself, the source, and yourself. Remember that authority is one of the weakest forms of evidence. Look beyond, and don't be afraid to change your mind on a subject. More data is still coming in on my antibody study of long haulers. I'm going to make another film, re-evaluate the data as the sample size grows. Now it's possible that as this sample grows, that it actually goes on to show something completely different and proves my previous hypothesis incorrect. And that's okay. In fact, that's good. That's how science should be. It should evolve as more information becomes evident. And on a global scale, rest assured that as time goes on and we start to see more studies, more data and fewer preprint studies being hailed as truth, the way this virus affects so many people will start to become a little clearer. And hopefully the good science will start to outweigh the bad. Till next time. What do you have to lose? I'll say it again. What do you have to lose? Take it.